which is in general usually a highlight for people. Thank you. Um, a highlight for people is to actually hear from people who have actually had that lived experience of pain. Because um, if you haven't had that experience, it is, but we're trying to help people with that experience, we need that insight. Um, and these next two people have done an amazing job of getting the attention of very well-meaning, but I think at times kind of arrogant healthcare practitioners, <laughs> um, trying to, to help them. And if we, if we hear the stories, we tend to do better. So I'd like to introduce Gilletta Belton. She's a nature lover, bibliophile, and storyteller. She's the co-founder of the Endless Possibilities Initiative, a nonprofit with the mission of empowering people with pain to live well. She's also the creator of MyCupOfJoe.com, where she makes sense of her experiences with pain and recovery through science and stories. Both projects were born of her experiences living with chronic pain, which forced her to medically retire from her job as a firefighter par paramedic, the career that had defined her. Her desire to understand her pain led her back to graduate school, where she earned her, earned her master's in science in human movement and studying pain science as her research focus. Now Joe explores what she has discovered through the lens of her personal story in hopes of starting meaningful conversations that lead to better pa possible paths forward. It is only together that we can improve the way pain is, is studied, understood, and treated. And then Keith Meldrum is a per persistent pain advocate with a focus on the integration of the lived experience narrative into the understanding and management of pain. Highlighting the importance of pain science, the biological, psychological, and sociological elements, and self-management and how these affects people's pain experience. My personal, his personal experience, but I have over 30 years of living with persistent pain, as well as his past work um, experience as a basic life support paramedic in British Columbia, afforded him unique insight into the complexities of persistent pain. So I'd like to bring to the stage Keith and Gilletta. Are we on? Can you hear us? Yeah. Or me? <coughs> yeah. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is an unusual format, as you can probably tell. And part of the reason that we wanted to do this and to have a conversation about pain is because so much of what has been so good about the San Diego Pain Summit over the years are the conversations that take place when we're here. It's that, that talking with one another about our ideas and our perspectives and coming to shared perspectives and different understandings perhaps that we might have come in with. And so many of those wonderful conversations don't take place in the classroom, but like outside, you know, during breaks, around the fire pit. And we kind of wanted to bring that environment in here um, and also be able to share that lived experience perspective. And I'm so grateful to Rajam for always including the patient perspective in the San Diego Pain Summits now. Because it's, it's looking at that, the complexity of pain and the problem of pain through a different lens um, and may perhaps start some different discussions that we can have when we leave. So that's kind of why we wanted to do this kind of conversational format. So we're going to share a little bit of our stories and start the conversation, but we want all of you to be a part of that conversation too. So you can do the, the questions in the app, but we're also allowed to break the rules and ask live questions yeah. too. So there will be a microphone available if you just want to stand up and have a question, because it's weird to have a conversation with an app and much easier yeah. to have conversation with people who ask questions. Um, so a lot of you probably have heard some of Keith and I's stories, and it's always interesting for me to figure out what, what lens do I want to share my story through in, today, you know, at this conference, because there's so many components to it. There's so many different things that, that happened along my own journey from, as, as Melanie talked about yesterday, you know, my own childhood in, in upbringing and experiences that I had <laughs> all the way to stepping off the fire engine and feeling a twinge in my hip, and that setting me on this, this path of ongoing persistent pain. But it, it didn't really start there, even though that's usually where I start my story. It started long before all of that. Um, one of the things that, that Ben said in his, his talk today got me thinking differently about what I wanted to say today, and it was that idea of, of wanting to be understood and also wanting to understand. And, and 
we need both of those. The people living in pain need, need both of those, and, and the clinicians that are working with people in pain need both of those things as well. We want to be understood. We want to feel heard, to be able to share our stories, because we are not our pain. We are not, like, our pain symptoms are not the totality of who we are as people, and it's not the totality of what that experience is. And it's not just sensations and emotions. It's pain within a, a lived life, you know? And, when you're living with pain for a long time, especially pain that you can't make sense of and that you don't understand, that pervades all aspects of your life and that becomes the lens through which you see and experience the world. Everything is colored by pain. When I look back at my own experiences, I call them like my dark years. Those early years were my dark years because I don't remember very much. All I remember is pain. It's like a neon flashing sign that's just pain, pain, pain. And I don't know what I did, you know, day to day. I don't remember, like, when I woke up in the morning, was I the one that made the coffee or did my husband make the coffee? Did I eat breakfasts when I was in all of this pain? And I was still working during this time, too. I was working in a civilian position when I couldn't go back to work as a firefighter. And I don't remember really going to work. And I don't remember interacting with people at work. I was lucky I could hide in my office a lot. But, but I share that just because a lot of times when we're sharing our stories, because we're, we're reflecting back on those experiences from a different place now. When I was in that darkness, when I was in that abyss, when I was in that chaos, I couldn't give voice to, to my experiences in any sort of cohesive or coherent way. And that's often what you are facing when, when patients are coming to see you. They don't have a coherent narrative. They don't have an ability to make sense of those experiences. And so it can feel disjointed. It can, Arthur Frank talks about, <laughs> it being a chaos narrative and it being and then, and then, and then. And part of what really good care is, is helping people to tell a cohesive story about themselves again. Helping them come back into their own being again and being a person again because we become so separated from ourselves. We become you know, so disconnected from our bodies and we become so disconnected from the person we were before this experience, and it can be life upending. For me, I was completely defined by my profession. I was the you know, strong, badass firefighter, and just that who I was as a person was, was part of my own protective mechanisms from you know, long before that. This, this person that I created, this person that I was, was a long time in the making. And so when, when this pain experience happened, this protective armor I had built around myself of strength and power and badassery and being mm -hmm. one of the guys, all of a sudden that just came crumbling down around me. And that was the most terrifying part of that experience. It wasn't the pain that I was feeling in my hip, it was what that pain meant in my life and how that pain affected my life. And that was never really addressed in my care from a lot of very well-meaning and caring professionals because we don't give people the, the opportunity to share the context of what that, that the, the life that that pain is lived within. Um, and, I, and that's some of the stuff that we want to talk about today. We really do want this to be driven by questions from, from all of you, not just be talking heads up here saying what we think is really important. We want to know what what you think is important and what you would like to discuss and, and talk about. So I'm not gonna go too much further um, and, and we'll let Keith share some of his story before we move on. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, so just to give a little context for me, um, my story's a little different because everybody has their own story. Um, but a lot of, it, not a lot, everything that Joe said talking about how um, pain becomes sort of, the, the, the effect of pain on your life becomes all encompassing, it's not, this might sound weird, but it's really not about the pain. Like after a while, you sort of just put that over here in a box, but it's, it's how it affects the totality of your life. My experience was a little different. Uh, so my introduction to pain, I was young. I was 16 years old, and um, that's a long time. It was almost 34 years ago now. Uh, but I, I found out for me the hard way that uh, if you go um, out all night and you drink and you don't get any sleep, which might be similar to some things that have been happening around here lately. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. The difference is if you get behind the wheel of your car, you will fall asleep. 
and I had no concept that that was even possible. Um, so what I did was I got pretty drunk, got an hour and a half's worth of sleep, got behind the wheel of my car, and then I rolled it down a bank, end over end. And so um, my introduction to pain was this very traumatic um, end over end car accident where I was only wearing a lap belt and I was sort of literally ripped in half internally. But at 16, in 1986, and I don't think it was any different in Canada as it was in, in anywhere in North America, um, this concept of, they were very good at dealing with the trauma, um, seven hours in surgery, they put me together, said to my parents, he'll live, he'll have some problems later. Oh, there's a little bit of an understatement. And then you're just sort of moved into the ongoing biomedical care of repeated surgeries. But then I developed ongoing pain. But I was told, we fixed everything. Like everything that's broken has been fixed. But at 16 and 17 and 18, I was trying to struggle with you know, a lot of what Joe had to talk to, but I did as a kid. And I had no tools and no understanding um, and no help or resources to say like, you know, this is a really traumatic event and you're probably gonna be a little screwed up for a while. Um, I was just told there's nothing wrong with you and everything's been fixed and we think you're kind of making it up. So those kind of um, interfaces, for lack of a better term, that you have with, with society, the medical system, Joe had, uh, not to tell her story, had some pretty shitty <laughs> experiences with the, uh, the workers' compensation system, they all add to your pain experience, but not, not just the physical symptoms of the pain, but just everything that it becomes to you. And it does become this overarching, blinding, all-encompassing, that's what your life is all about. And it's not, it's not a very fun way to live. And until you start to understand, and I had to do all the work, sorry, I had to do all the work myself to try and figure out what this meant, and that knowledge and that understanding then starts to help make sense of what the pain is. But to get there, for me, my interactions with the healthcare system for the first 15 years were horrible, absolutely terrible. I was told more often than not, there's nothing wrong with you, or what do you want us to do for you? Like, what are you here for today? So what we're hoping to bring through this conversation, we really, really want to have a conversation with you guys, is what can we help you from our experiences? I would suggest we're probably in better places now than we were a while ago. But what have we learned and what can we help you to be the best at what you do? And, and I get that somebody with, with persistent pain is a complex patient. I mean, looking back on it now, that's pretty screwed up, you know? And I brought all that screwed up in this <laughs> to, uh, to a doctor because I just thought I needed to have the right surgery to be fixed. And what I didn't realize was bringing all of this past emotion and grief and anger and all these things that were not just my pain, but I had all wrapped it up in my pain. And I was like, if they just do the right surgery, and I've had like 15 of them, so I'm kind of an expert now, but if they just do the right one, I'll be fine. And until I started to realize that it was way more than the right intervention or the right needle in my spinal cord, that, that's how I could live better with pain. And I am still in active medical care. I am a patient, I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> I am the classic definition of a patient. I will have yet another surgery this year. I still get, um, I, have lid I get lidocaine infusions. Um, I, like, I am a patient, and I hate that word. But I'm still in active care, but learning how to live much better with pain. And I can reconcile those two. So I'm not all about, you know, it's not, there isn't a bio uh, biological component. Because absolutely there is in my case. But it's, it's bringing it all together and understanding the person's total experience. And, and I think that's so interesting to bring up since Ben brought that up, that is it patient-centered care, person-centered care? And it's, it's a question that I've struggled with too because I'm always the patient perspective when I'm presenting at conferences and I haven't been in active care since um, 2013. So, so I think the context of the person in, in um, when you're in care, that it's that role that you're playing when you're with their healthcare professional. You're a patient in that role, but you're not a patient in, the, in your life you know, when you're outside of that, that medical encounter. So it's just an interesting question in play. But in, in talking with um, Keith over the years, there are, are like pain origin stories, so to speak, are much different. He had a near fatal, very traumatic car accident where he almost died. Um, and not to tell Keith's story, but like wanted to die while he was in that 
yep. ditch. <laughs> um, in mine, I was just stepping off the fire engine and felt a twinge in my hip, and, and that was it. But yet, we both had very similar experiences in the healthcare system where we did not feel heard or believed or validated. I was accused of malingering by one of the battalion chiefs in my fire department, just outright accused of, of faking it essentially so that I wouldn't have to go to work when all I wanted was to go back to work and to be myself again and to have you know, my identity back. And, and being placed under that kind of scrutiny and within the workers' compensation system, especially in the United States, I, it, that's all I can speak to, is in, in particular Southern California because I was a firefighter in Orange County, um, your moral integrity is investigated before your pain is. You are investigated as a human being before whatever you need to be treated for is investigated. Um, when, I, when I first felt that twinge in my hip, I was still at work. I was still working 24, 48, 72 hour shifts. Um, and I, I, it was just a twinge. I didn't think much of it at the time. I worked another five months. And during that time, went to PT. I was given muscle relaxants, you know, did all the things. But the pain kept getting worse, and I kept losing function. Um, and in retrospect, looking back, like the, the clinical reasoning, reasoning of the care that I received doesn't make much sense to me in retrospect because it was all about strength and stability and doing all of these exercises, which I loved because it supported every single one of my own biases. I was a firefighter who loved to work out. I was a total gym rat. I'd get off work at 7.30 in the morning and go to the gym for four hours because I was that kind of person. I was also paleo and did CrossFit, and I would let you know. <laughs> um, and also try to get you into my world and come do it with me. Um, so, and I was still doing those things too, and, and I never, I never had, like had a break. My hip didn't get a break, and it was all about strengthening my hip more, becoming more stable. And over time, then as I was trying to, to get stronger, and I, I mean, I was, nah, to humble brag, not to, but yes, I'm going to. Like I was deadlifting 250 pounds at that time. It wasn't a hip strength issue. That wasn't, that wasn't what was causing my pain. I could also do 12 strict pull-ups, no kipping. Um, but, well, I feel inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, and, and I share some of that too, just to provide the context of how disruptive it is then to no longer be able to do those things and to be that person. Um, in that, in that system, and, and I share this just because so many people that are coming to you have been in, in similar circumstances too, especially if they're in the workers' compensation system. When I did go off work five months after this twinge in my hip happened, I was, in that my case, what my case was investigated. I went four months without any care, four months without seeing a healthcare professional. So I wasn't even getting, I wasn't getting bad information, I was just getting no information. And now I'm off work. So I don't have any understanding of what's happening in my hip and why it's hurting so much and why it's getting worse. I have no one giving me any information at all about it. And now I'm separated from everything that makes me me, which at that time was my job and going to the gym. And I mean, my fire family, I spent more time with than I spent with my husband. I was at the station more than I was at home. I was with my crew more than I was with my husband. And as a firefighter in our department, if you get hurt, you are completely disconnected from the people that you worked with. That's a very common thing in, in fire, police, military. When you get hurt, you're separated from your unit, your crew. And that's a very disruptive thing too. So that all provides some context around this know-nothing twinge that didn't mean much at the time. And I, that I had no explanation for for a long time. And then when I did go back, you know, I did the injections thing and I had surgery and not surprisingly, I didn't get fixed. Those things didn't fix me. Um, even though I had very high expectations that they would. I had my surgery 13 months after the, the twinge, 13, 14 months after the twinge. Um, and I went from being this bad, I had really big biceps. <laughs> being this really strong, badass firefighter to losing 30 pounds. When I was weighed for my surgery, I had lost nearly 30 pounds from when I went off work. That was in, that was in about a six month period of time, six, seven month period of time. But I never saw the same clinicians, so no one noticed that drastic weight loss during my care. So that lack of continuity of care, that lack of having 
a healthcare professional oversee my, my case, because in workers' comp, it's, it's handled by a claims adjuster. It's not handled by like one particular doctor that you're going to. Um, nobody really noticed. So in my paperwork, in my medical file, it will say things like pleasant than female. Like that's, like that's a positive thing. The doctor's being real nice, pleasant than female. The last thing I wanted to be was a pleasant than female. <laughs> <laughs> like that is not who I am as a person. Um, and, and it's just, it's so, it's so disorienting when the, that now, so this is, that's who he sees me as, this pleasant thin female, and that's not who I am. That medical file doesn't say anything about who I am. It doesn't tell the story of me. It tells the story of a hip that didn't respond to treatment, of a, a challenging patient that failed all of the treatments. That's what that medical file shows. It doesn't show that how that pleasant thin female, when she looks in the mirror, doesn't recognize herself doesn't see herself in that stranger that's looking back and doesn't know what to do with that and has no guidance in what to do with that. And I'm gonna let you go on with something because I'm getting all yeah. choked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I made a note to myself here because, um, and like Joe said, our, our, um, our paths into pain are, are sort of different, but there's a lot of commonalities and you mentioned identity. And um, again, I, for me, it was a lot different because at 16, at 16 you don't have an identity, for Christ's sakes. At 16. <laughs> um, so I'll just share a little bit because you guys are all trapped in this room and I think we locked the doors. Um, pretty sure we And did. the title was just a conversation, so we yeah. can really talk about so whatever we're we want. Talk. Um, but when, when I had my accident, like Joe said, it was, it was pretty spectacular. Like, I mean, if I would have been able to see it, I think it would have been looked pretty cool because it rolled, I rolled the car down a bank end over end. It was an elevated curve which um, basic physics says um, when the highway curve goes this way in your sleep, you will go straight ahead. And bang, down it goes. But um, as Joe said, well, I, I self-extricated from the car because the door came off. Uh, it was upside down. I did only the lap belt I was wearing across my gut. That's how I got ripped to half. And I tore through my um, abdominal wall, small and large um, bowel, and I was bleeding all of, pretty much all of my blood volume into my stomach. And I crawled for uh, so I'm Canadian. I crawled for like hundreds of meters. <laughs> I was like, what, 20 feet and whatever. I made it. To, yeah, I don't know. I made it. I made it to the back bumper of the car, and that's where I just collapsed. Um, now people saw me leave the highway, and long story short, that's literally why I'm alive today. Because without being hyperbolic, but I'm gonna. Um, when you're dying, you know it. And I didn't see a bright white light. And grandma was still alive, so she wasn't able to call me home. But it was just, I could feel the life force coming out of me. And the pain, I, I can talk a lot, as Joe knows. I have no words to describe that pain. All I know is I wanted it to be over. And there was a guy beside me, because the, the vehicle that ultimately saw me leave the highway was a, a railway crew, and they had a first aid attendant. And this poor first aid attendant was like, oh, it'll be okay. Um, like, oh, no, it won't. <laughs> but thanks, buddy. Um, and all I just, I, I, I don't have a lot of memories from the car accident. Um, and some that I have, I don't know if they're real. But I, I just remember lying at the toe of that slope and just begging to die. Like, I just wanted it to be over. I didn't care anymore. The pain was, I, I, I don't have words to describe that pain. And to this day, um, I still carry a certain amount of grief and shame for giving up. Because we'd all like to think when we're faced with adversity, something like that, you just rise up and go through the chest. I quit. I was done. I, I could, I had no will to live whatsoever. And for years, that always bothered me because I gave up. And I think that was underlying a lot of the um, challenges that I had going forward. But I had no identity. At 16, I was then thrown into the medical system, lots of surgeries. I mean, in the first few months, six months of the, after my car accident, I had like four surgeries. They kept, and back then they didn't really know what to do, so I would have pain, so what would they do? Open it up, see what's going on in there. I mean, the scar that I have here has probably been opened eight times. And they would just go rooting around there to figure out what's going on, so. Um, but I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I didn't know who I was or what I was, but I was adamant 
that I was not going to be defined by this accident. Like it was just, it was not, I was going to show the world that I was more than this accident, um, but I had this underlying pain. And it got really messy when my family GP, I was 19 years old, I probably had six surgeries by that point, I'm like, why does it still hurt? And he said to me, he was the, we have fixed everything that was broken, it's all in your head. So I'm now like, oh, great, <laughs> I'm nuts too. Like, why would I keep putting myself through these surgeries and these interventions? Why do I think I have pain if I really don't? And that, again, sent me off in just a completely different direction. So I really, um, I can empathize with Joe's story about loss of identity. I didn't have one. I didn't know who I was, and I was getting wrapped up in what this pain was going to be. So I made a lot of really bad decisions, <laughs> like a lot, um, in an effort not to be defined by my pain. So it, it becomes, because it's all part of your life, it's not just the pain, it's how it impacts you and how it affects you. And I was going to show the world that this thing wasn't going to stop me. So it's, I don't know if I can underscore enough how much it is so much more than just the person's, you know, tissue damage or the traumatic event. In my case, it was a car accident. In Joe's case, it was stepping off the sideboard of an engine. It doesn't matter what the precipitating event is. It's so much more. It, that's why, for me, the biggest, one of the most important things is to address sort of the emotions and the psychology and that grief and loss that comes with it, because that's what I struggled through until my pain experience was validated. It took 15 years before somebody told me that it was real. And so for 15 years, I was doctor shopping, looking for the right solution, trying any intervention, all the time in the back of my head while I was having either a surgery or needles stuck in me, um, which is a rather unpleasant experience unto itself. Um, I'm like, why am I doing this to myself if I'm making it all up? It was, it was really hard to reconcile that. So. And it's, it's when you read the qualitative literature that, that being dehumanized, not feeling heard, not feeling believed is such a common theme for people who live with ongoing pain. And so much of that is because it's complex and there's not a lot of clinicians who are really comfortable in dealing with people like us. Um, and because they don't have the answer, then we are just told there's nothing wrong with you or there's nothing that we can do. And that's the most soul-crushing thing that you can hear. Not even just the there's nothing wrong with you part, but the there's nothing we can do. Because then you're just left with I have no way of making sense of this experience that I'm going through and I have no way forward. There is no viable future. We there is question. no future for we me. We got a question. So Liz has asked, when I was 19 at the GP, how would I have wished that conversation would have gone? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you know, looking back on it, um, I wish now that that would have been the point where my pain experience was validated. Because I was really, I was pretty messed up. I was pretty angry. Um, and to be told by your GP, who the medical system is hierarchical just in nature, so I looked at this man who is all-knowing and he has the education and all that. And when he says there's nothing wrong with you, it was soul-crushing. It was devastating. Um, so I believe my, the next 15 years probably would have been much healthier and more effective if he just would have said, you know, we don't really know, um, but we can look into this further. But he, I was dismissed. I was like, you're done. And I, choose, I, and I chose at that point to never go back to see that GP again. <laughs> series of surgeries over the course of 20 years as well. Um, did you ever find, and I was a little, I, of course I was very naive about what the process of, oh, you can get PT for your injuries, you know, this type of thing. And even like 12 years after the accident, I had a six hour surgery for bone necrosis. And after the surgery, the, the surgeon was like, 
We're not gonna give you rehab because there's only a 30% chance to be walking. So did you ever have to experience um, that sort of, that happened to me four times where I was denied rehab because um, they considered my case too far gone that I was a victim of a bomb. Um, did you ever experience that sort of pushback? Did you wanna answer that? I, I, was, never given, I was never offered anything. <laughs> yeah, well that's, that's I asked for it and they yeah. wouldn't. So in, in my experience, because, um, and. Well, um, and I didn't have any other than the internal injuries. Oh, and I broke my nose in the car accident too. <laughs> Smashed my face into the steering wheel, which um, funnily enough, they, when my parents found out I had an accident, they said, oh, he's fine. He just broke his nose. You can go see him in the hospital. Um, but I guess because my, all of my injuries were sort of abdominal, um, I was never ever offered any kind of rehab or you should try these things. I was cut open, things put in, things taken out. I've got lots of really cool stuff in me that um, the government of Canada has given me. Um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, like, that's terrible. I was just yeah. never offered anything, but to, I didn't even know to ask. I didn't know what to ask, but to be, to ask yeah, and be I denied. Remember, but, I mean, even one surgeon said, isn't your, don't you, aren't you a sports therapist? Can't you figure it out? Yeah. Like, I mean, and I had double knee surgery and back surgery. Yeah. I mean, I, I think <laughs> that's, that's probably worse than not being offered anything to ask and be denied. So. Well, and I, I was denied being in the work comp system. I was in a flare-up, and I, was, I called my claims adjuster from work because I just wanted to go to PT, which, which didn't really work for me, but I, I liked it. That's yeah. terrible. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm so sorry that you went through that. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's kind of like, you're like, well, I mean, here I am in a room full of PTs. I'm like, oh, well, normal people do PT. And then I have to look at it like, oh, maybe it was my socioeconomic situation. Or like they were just viewing me as a special case. Or, you know, like, what was the view there? And then I'm like, OK, well, and then when I talk to people later, they're like, no, you should have had rehab. It should have yeah. just been available to you. They should have said, Right, that you yeah. should just be able to figure it out on your own. Right, but yeah, you can't. <laughs> no. You know, it's not for you can. And that's, I think, that's why we need all of you. We need guidance. And I think that's a perfect and, example, and it sort of talks a little bit of what Ben talked about and, and what Joe can speak to much better than I can. But we talk about words matter. And when, when the healthcare system says to you, oh, you probably only have a 30% chance of walking, that doesn't exactly make you feel like you should rush out and do everything you can to help yourself because what's stuck in your head is, you know, it's probably a lost cause. So that's all about that validation and supporting and um, not providing a negative narrative from the yeah. healthcare system. Like you don't need to blow sunshine up people's ass. <laughs> yeah, I would suggest. Um, but you I mean, can if you want to. But. You can, yeah. Like, it's, you have options, you as do, Ben yeah. would say. But. Okay, yeah. Um, but I mean, that's a perfect example of just an absolute abysmal interaction from the healthcare system to the person, the patient, that does not provide any kind of hope. And I gotta tell you, as you live with pain, hope is critically important. And it's not about being um, unrealistic or thinking it's all sunshine and roses or somebody blowing sunshine up your ass. Hope matters, it's really, really valuable. And when you take that hope away, or in Haley's case, probably crush the shit out of it, um, you have set somebody back years. I'm and, getting on a soapbox now. And it doesn't even have to be a big thing like that in terms of, of language, and, and I, I talk about it a lot in my presentations. Like we're, depending on the, the lens that you're being viewed through, the clinician that you're speaking to, you're told everything that is wrong with you and messed up about you and how many dysfunctions you have. And a lot of those dysfunctions are made up. You know, it's just a way of explaining something that they're seeing, but they label it a, a movement dysfunction, SI joint dysfunction, like all of these dysfunctions just because you have pain here and I can't explain it, we're just gonna call it a dysfunction. You're moving weird, I'm gonna call it a movement dysfunction. Um, and all of those things just start to pile up. The more clinicians you see, the more things that are wrong with you. And, and Melly touched upon it yesterday about how important language is. And for me, I mean, I will never forget all of the no's in my workers' compensation paperwork. No running, no squatting, no awkward positions. So no squatting, like that means I can't go to the bathroom. 
no awkward positions. I don't even know what that means or what that looks yeah. like. So if I get caught doing one of those things, an awkward position, I, my claim is then, you know, in jeopardy. No sitting for longer than 20 minutes. No, like I just had all of these rules and all of these no's that if, if a claims investigator was to see me do that, then I, I potentially no longer get care. So it's so hard to get better when, when you have all of that in your paperwork. And it, on top of that, all of those no's then become a part of your belief system about what you can and cannot do. And so much of that is what you cannot do. We don't do enough to build people up and tell them how courageous and resilient and awesome and adaptable and strong they are. We don't focus on all of those elements of that person. Instead, we just pile on how much is wrong with them rather than saying, this is what's right with you and this is what's going to help you to go forward. There was a couple hands in the... a bunch of app questions, so, and we didn't discuss previously how, how would you like to do this? How about we do one from the audience and one, from, we'll go back and forth. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being our microphone person. Yeah. I didn't know that was going to be your what? job. Oh, Lars has one. He has the app. <coughs> Lars. Go ahead, Lars. So, my question is, or um, well not actually, well, it is a question I wanted to poke a bit, pick a big a bit about your brains, but in my perspective, a lot of what I see as a clinician and when I go around talking with other clinicians, they sort of tend to paint a worst case scenario picture, but not a best case scenario picture. And I think from the clinical side, it's often that I feel that some clinicians are afraid to um, set too high goals or to promise too much, but were that at some point in your experience, both of your experiences, anybody who actually tried to instill hope to, in your journey towards the, in, the, in the healthcare system? I would say not, not actually in the healthcare system where I started to have hope was when I started coming to the San Diego Pain Summit and interacting with clinicians here. So clinicians were a huge part of me moving forward, but it wasn't in care. It was in conversations here. And it was people who helped me to make sense of my, my experience um, in a way that I, I never received when I was actually in, in active care. Um, and I think, I think that that generation of hope, like it can't just, you can't just give someone hope. It has to come through those conversations and, and a dialogue and coming to a shared understanding of what is possible that does make um, biological sense. You know, it does make medical sense, but it also makes biographical sense for that person because if they don't believe that that's true for them or that it applies to them, it's, it's, not, it's not something that you can just hand them and give to them. Um, and, and there are so many constraints and so many barriers for, for healthcare professionals to be able to just have those conversations. I'm so stoked that John Lawner is gonna be here next year because I love his framing of it being conversations inviting change. Like that's, it's through those conversations that those different possibilities become you know, apparent and open, that there is a way for, there are ways forward, not even just one. Um, and also through that, that conversation and, and being able to come up with new narratives can lend us different perspectives on what we've been through as well. Like our, our stories aren't stagnant. Our, our you know, <laughs> memories of, of what we've experienced aren't stagnant. They are changing. We can have some influence over that. We can reframe what those experiences were, the more information and in, in making sense of things that we can do. One of Bessel van der Kolk's quotes, it, or I, it's a paraphrase, but he talks about when you've experienced a traumatic experience, whatever that might be, that, that in order to be able to you know, move forward from that, you need to be able to make sense of that experience and you need to become an agent in your own rescue. And, but we can only become that agent when we make sense of things, when we you know, understand and are understood. And, and that's, that's not being done often enough in, in healthcare, I think. And I, you can't just give someone information and have, expect that to then make sense to them and be, then be able to incorporate it into their understanding of what they're going through in, in their story. It has to be through that conversation and, 
in understanding what might be helpful for them. I mean, when I first learned about pain science, it was life changing for me, it truly was. And then I thought that that would be the case for everybody, so I just fire hose them with all of the information <laughs> that I have learned, thinking this is going to transform your life, and it didn't, because that's not how humans work. Yeah. I'm a particularly nerdy person who likes to read a lot of articles and things like that was really resonant with me and helped me to conceptualize things differently. But the way that I make sense of the world is not the way that someone else makes sense of the world. And if you don't figure out how they make sense of the world, um, just handing them a different narrative or handing them hope isn't going to work. I would say just briefly for me, same thing. Nobody at any time, and I, I can, looking back on it, trying to be rational, uh, I can understand maybe why there were some challenges and why you know a doctor didn't want to, they didn't want to overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, so what you get is nothing. Um, and but uh, like Joe said, I mean nobody ever sort of had a conversation about okay, you know this isn't great, but there are things that we can do and we can work together. Um, I kind of stumbled across sort of the introduction to hope um, when I was sort of introduced to an interventional pain clinic of all places. But the the people there were the ones that sort of sort of embraced me and just said like, hey, we can, we're gonna do some things, but we're gonna work together, we're gonna try and figure this out. Um, but, I mean, like Joe said, you can't just say to somebody, here's a book on hope. You know, go read it and you'll be fine, so. Um, but it's, it's not wrong, it's not wrong to work with people and, and, and say that, you know, hope is a good thing and it's positive. I, maybe some people will not be overly successful, but I think in the absence of providing that hope, you're setting up people for a really yeah. tough struggle. I think struggle. you can hold uncertainty and hope in the same yeah. conversation. Absolutely, you know? yeah, yeah. Okay, so now a question from online from Crystal. Um, what are some specific questions you wish had been asked by your healthcare providers? What could or would have better enabled you to tell your story so that you were and felt heard as a person? Tell me your story. Yeah, like, like how does pain make you feel? Like, how does this impact your life? Not, what do you want me to do for you today? Yeah, I don't like that one either. No. Um, so, like, like Joe said, like, tell me your story and how how was pain impacting your life? Not, and I received this many time. A doctor who would look at my chart, look at look over the chart and say, and so, do you, what do you want? What do you, so? What do you want me to do for you today? At that point, the conversation was over. Um, I think that, that I mean, and it, it can be framed in a lot of ways, but, but and it's really, it's just being a human to a human. You know, ha it truly, I think so much can be born of just having a conversation with someone like you would with any other human. It's a patient, but patients aren't some, you know, weird species of human. They're just humans who are experiencing something that they're having difficulty figuring out and knowing what to do about, and they're coming to you for your expertise and your knowledge, and have a conversation where those, where those two things are shared. One of my favorite questions is one that um, Brent Godek from the Oregon Pain Summit, what he asks is, what, what is worrying you the most, you know, about you know, this diagnosis, this pain, <clears throat> this treatment plan? It, it can apply to so many things, but figuring out what really worries people um, can be a, a, a door opening onto a conversation that, that might actually help lead that treatment plan in a direction that's gonna be relevant to that person. Like, what worries you? Tell me what's, you know, tell me your story. Who are you as a person? And, and that recognition that who we are before you is not the entirety of who we are as people. And maybe having some understanding of who we are as people um, would benefit the, the healthcare encounter. That's not right. a pleasant, thin female. <laughs> you are pleasant, though. Maybe you don't mean to be, but... She has her moments. We're going to pass this down to Caitlin. Um, so you have to keep track of everyone in the order of your hands are up. So... That was the plan. I just want to make sure we have that. Okay. This is for, I think, more for Joe. Within the workers' compensation system, um, it's very limiting for the people who are, at the, okay, the patient, sorry. <laughs> and, um, but also like the other practitioners, like as a physical therapist, no one cared what I recommended or what I thought either. 
and it's hard to advocate or to, to try to get help for the person or the patient. Um, so within the limitations of that, do you know how we can be advocates or to, to help make recommendations for like psychological care or other? So within systems, like I, I, don't, I don't know how those processes work. I, I've been the, the recipient of a lot of recommendations not, not being um, accepted by work comp. Like my, my surgeon was wonderful. He was, he was the best person during the, the course of my care. He never once made me feel like my pain wasn't real, even after the surgery didn't work. Um, or not didn't work, but it didn't relieve my pain. He did fix the anatomy. I'm sure the anatomy looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> But he never once made me feel like my pain wasn't real, and he knew that there was other things that could help, but work comp denied all of it. Um, he, he was the one that encouraged me to get out of the system, and because I'm a person of privilege, I was able to and to pay out of pocket for my, my own care and my own choices, um, which, which brings up that thing, too. We had bad experiences as, as privileged people. You know, we're both white people who, who <laughs> grew up in middle-class environments, who um, had supportive families mm -hmm. and all yep. of these things, and we still had a really bad experience. Then when you add in poverty, you know, people of color, systemic biases and institutionalized racism, like there are so many problems within systems that as an individual clinician, um, it, you, you can't address those things, but I think it's why it's so important. Melanie brought it up, Ben brought it up, I, Corey brought it up, those, those social elements, we can't, we can't keep letting them be the elephant in the corner. If we really want to make change, if we really want to change people's experiences and help them to be better, to help them be healthy, we have to start having those conversations. We have to start advocating at those levels for change. We can do what we can as individuals, and I'm not saying like this is a call to arms, let's all get up and go march on the Capitol, but I kind of am too, because we can. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> It's a really clear message here, yeah, Joe, really, just so you know. Is, yeah. yeah, very clear message here. I'm not saying this, but I am. But we, we can't just, just say, like, there are these social de determinants of health, and I can't do anything about those, because we can. You know, we can make change if we come together because we want to make change. Um, until, we, until we start addressing those, those inequities in care, it's going to be really difficult. The workers' compensation system is a really difficult system to, to work within. I mean, it was interesting for me. I had, like, my quality medical examiner um, who was an, an ortho. I think he was a surgeon, too. He was an ortho. Um, he would do the quality medical exams for the state, but he would not accept workers' compensation patients in his practice because he knew how difficult it, the system was to get, get anything done for anyone. But no matter what gets denied or, or um, you know, referrals that can't get made, what you can do for that person is believe them and validate them and provide you know, free re resources as much as possible and that sort of thing. But, but telling them that their pain is very real um, and that there are some things that, that can be done about it, not that there's nothing that can be done, even though this system isn't working for you, trying to figure out those things that, that might be able to work for that person, um, I think is something that's possible to be, to be done on, on an individual level. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a terrible system to be within. If you, if you have patients who are in that system, just, just that recognition, and, and um, it's really, really hard. It's really hard as a human being in that system. When your moral integrity is constantly in question, it's, it's just hard. So just be compassionate with those people because they're going through some stuff. And usually, if they're in the work comp system, their job is on the line. Their financial security might be on the line. There's a lot of things that come with that, too. OK. Ready for a question from online? OK, so from Sean Overin. As clinicians, we want people to understand why they hurt and is, um, and is something that has been mentioned to be important. What was communicated to you and or what were you exposed to by activity, exercise, that helped you understand the hurt better? Um, I'll start. So um, what was communicated to you and what or were you exposed to, activity, exercise? So uh, my story, and again, um, I don't like the word story, I don't like word page. There's a lot of shit I don't like, I just don't know the better word. Um, so I'm a bit of a complainer You're without so a solution. Angry. I know, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> for the first 15 years, <laughs> um, nothing was communicated to me. Nothing. It was, uh, it was either a surgical intervention, and I've had a lot of them. I had one surgery because they were going to free trap nerves. Do we even know what that means? I mean, I was there, and I don't know what the hell it meant. Um, but there was no fault. There was nothing. It was, we do something to you, and if that doesn't make you better, it's not our problem. But no, you could try this or you could try that. It changed a bit when, and Joe just talked about it, and we'll probably hammer on this, the, the validation. Do not underestimate the importance of validating that person's experience. Just that means so much. And once I went through that process, um, then I was a little more open to things. And I think I needed to also be open to be able to start to hear some of these things. And then that's when I started to, you know, talk about, and here's where we start to get into kind of the self-management stuff. You know, what can I do to, because there are things I can do to help myself. Prior to a validation, I figured I had no role to play in this whatsoever. It was up to you to fix me. I was absolutely passive, and every time that you, and I say the collective use of the healthcare system, didn't get it right, is because you didn't try hard enough, or I didn't find the right doctor. Um, it wasn't until that validation occurred and then people started to say things like, you know, um, you can do things like some movement that is safe for you, you know, find what you like to do, um, learn self-management techniques, which were, was a real change for me. You know, I learned that breathing can regulate your pain. When I was first told that, I said, you're nuts. It's impossible. <laughs> um, and just to tie into this a little bit, my wife used to say to me when I was under stress, my pain would increase. And I'd say, it's not possible. Absolutely two unrelated things. And then I started reading and learning. I'm like, oh, I get it. So to this day, I have to routinely remind her that she was right, and I appreciate all <laughs> that. Um, so, you know, so for me, you know, after the validation, what was exposed? Now we're getting into that self-management stuff. You know, find what works for you. Sort of relaxation, movement, um, healthy, safe movement. You know, um, in my case, I am somewhat limited what I can do. I still have physical injuries. I have essentially no left abdominal mu muscles, and I've lost over 20% of my right. So um, I, may, I, I do a real cool sit-up. Can't, it can't be done. You can literally hold me down with your finger on my forehead. I can't get up. So I am still somewhat limited in what I can do. But you find the things that you can do. And, and it's everything from movement to relaxation to breathing, um, resiliency, hope, those yeah. kind of things. And, and for me, the, like understanding the biology of pain better it was useful for me. I know it's not useful for everybody, but understanding just how my biology works as a human and, and understanding the relationships between stress and pain. Actually, stress biology was one of the, the things that helped me to understand what was going on way more, especially like in, you know, in populations that, that are always looking for threats in innocuous places like police and fire, like you're used to, to being a little bit ramped up. And then when something happens with that, those ramped up systems, it, it just was making sense for me as to, to why this might have happened. And then um, I just needed to calm shit down, as Greg Lehman would say, <laughs> and, and was able to start you know, working toward that. Um, and so having that little, having, being able to make sense of my pain through the, that lens of biology was, was really helpful for me in, in being able to, to see a different way forward. And I had become so rigid in my rules around movement and posture, like so rigid in my rules, because I had, was told I had all these movement dysfunctions, that my hip was weak, um, you know, the instability stuff, like all of these different things. I became more and more controlling and hypervigilant around movement and posture. And I would, I would to hold myself in, in the correct posture, thinking that that would help my pain, and, and that doesn't, just yeah. note for everyone, that doesn't <laughs> <FYI>. work. <laughs> um, and like, if I just moved, you know, more correctly, this would, this would figure itself out, but you can only, like, you can only do that for so long before you're just not moving at all, because you're, you're not doing it right. It was actually Todd's book, Playing With Movement. That, that opened my eyes to like, like being able to explore movement again in a different way and to not have so many rules surrounding it and to just like play and, and move with, with some ease and, and um, 
not be so focused on exactly how I was doing it. So those types of messages in terms of like the activity and exercise, um, for me it was it being not structured, not so structured was what was helpful for me. Um, in photography, it was actually another thing that got me moving in a different way because I would get myself into positions to get a better, I only had my phone, to get a better shot and I would find myself, you know, ass to grass squatting to get a better picture of a river and I'm like, ah, I'm squatting. Like, <laughs> look at that. But it wasn't, I didn't, didn't go to the gym to practice squatting to be able to do that. Um, it was getting back to things that I, that I, I like to do and, and playing and just, just moving. But it was having an understanding too of, of pain, understanding pain differently that allowed me to do that because I wasn't so fearful that I was making things worse, that I was doing more damage to my hip, that I was effing up my surgery, which I thought for, for a really long time afterwards. Because if I still had pain, I had to mess something up because that, that was kind of the, you know, the operational understanding that I had at the time. I don't know if that answered the question, but it answered a question. <laughs> All right, and then in the back here in the room. Uh, could you do us a favor and one at a time define what you consider the definition of pain for you was? Do you want to take a kick at that first? Throw you under the bus. <laughs> Throw you under the bus? Thanks. Yeah, Thanks I'm for here that. For you. Um, to me, I don't know that I, that I have a, an, a definition of it. I, I don't really think it's something that's definable. To me, it's, it's an experience. It's a human experience um, that is complex and, and made of a lot of things. I think we often conflate like nociception with pain. Like we, we conflate the, the sensations that we feel as pain. I don't see it as, as that. I see it as the, the totality of that experience. For me, that's what, what pain is. It, it's all the things, not just where the pain is, is felt. It's, it's in the pain in the life kind of thing. Um, I, I don't envy like ISP for trying, having to come up with a definition for pain, because I really don't think it's a, a definable thing. It'd be like, what is, what is our definition of love? Or, you know, like it's mm -hmm. just a, it's a human, a complex human experience um, that is, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I, see, that's why I threw you into the box. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but I have to agree. It's, um, you have to agree with my non-answer? <laughs> pretty much, because it, it, it is an experience. It, it, Initially, um, you know, pain to me was, was pain. It was this un, severely unpleasant physical experience. Um, but as time goes on, you re it, it's the totality of your experience. Yeah. And, and after a while, and I can't say this is for everybody, but you find the actual physical pain, um, you know, the, the nociception, my pain is neuropathic. Um, you you, you kind of park that over here because after a while, you're like, I can kind of handle that shit. You start to figure out ways to deal with it but it still impacts your life. I mean, I have, to this day, I make some terrible decisions. I that do, if anyone saw yeah. me last night. <laughs> um, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and most of them are driven by, you know, I, I've been doing this for two thirds of my life. Right? It'll be 34 years, August 10th, and I, you know, but who's counting? Um, but I still, it, with everything I know and everything that I've read, I still make terrible decisions, put myself in a place where I will increase my pain because it, you know, it's something that's taken away from me and I need to get some sort of control back because it's the totality of your experience. It is this, it, we're inactive people. We're in the world all the time being affected by what's going on. And I'm just rambling here because I don't know how you define <laughs> the undefinable. Yeah. I really don't. Sorry. I will say that before I defined pain as damage, like that was yeah. an equation for yes. me. Pain so as a equal damage. Up to that answer, I appreciate that so much. Non answer? Sorry. We are all painters in this room. You've asked us to paint your house. You just didn't tell us what color, what walls, and how. So we went to the book and we said, based on your gender, race, if you want, um, injury, we think black is the right color or blue is the right color. And how many shades of blue are there? So as a caregiver, I would invite every caregiver to remind themselves to say to the patient, what do you want to accomplish from your care? So when you've come to me and you've asked me 
to paint my house, and I've, or I've said to you, paint my house. And so you're like, well, I think you want it to be white. It goes back to just what you've said there. You need to have conversation. that conversation. And why do you want to paint your house? What does your house mean to you? Like, explore those, because, I mean, I might not know really, I might not know what color I want to paint it until you and I have a conversation about it, and then I'm like, oh, shit, I hate blue. I don't want blue, I want it red. And we can't get there unless we have that conversation and that connection. And I think that, so defining pain, which would be defining pain for all of our experiences, is different than me having a conversation with you about my pain, and that wasn't the question. So I think there's a difference there, too. My definition of pain is, is something that would have to be universal and apply to everyone. And, but my experience of pain, I can share and, and yeah. provide more of that, that picture. I Everybody actually don't. knows what I don't, I don't, color their house wants to be painted. I, I hired someone I to decide I, the colors for my house, so if I you did. want to paint your house. You so this know metaphor, what color you I guess the metaphor like. is just isn't working. For I let me. my wife pick. Really, yeah. <laughs> no. I literally, we literally hired someone to yeah, pick the same. colors yeah. for our house. So, yeah. all right, let's take um, a question from online. Um, and real quick in the room, if you want to toss up your hand, Julie will grab. We'll give, get you the mic. Um, so the next question from Nathan Hers. Thanks for sharing your stories. How were you first introduced to the concept of living well with pain? And from someone who's gone through that process, what would you tell or ask from a clinician having that, cl that conversation with someone? I'm going to jump on this first, Keith. Please. Yep. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I was introduced to the concept. I just started doing it um, and, and got lucky in that regard. But, but um, I, I feel like I can... Um, talk about peer support a little bit through this question, because one of the things that I think can be so beneficial and what we've learned just through sharing our experiences is those connections between people living with pain and being able to, to show that it is possible to live with pain, that it is possible to move forward is so incredibly valuable. So learning from other people who have been through it is, is the best way that I think that that can come across. You know, understanding and hearing the, the stories of others, but even better, being able to talk with those, those people who've had those experiences, I think is incredibly valuable and that we don't use peer support enough. And it's used in other areas of healthcare really successfully. And Sharna is doing amazing things in, in Oregon and facilitating some peer support stuff there. Um, I, I think that's a huge, a huge area that is not really well explored right now and that we should because people talking to each other with that have a shared experience of pain can really do a lot to help each other. Um, and then all of the, the burden isn't on the healthcare system. You know, it's, and so much of pain is, is it's so, it can be so isolating and you become so disconnected from your life and disconnected with other people that through peer support, you can start reestablishing re some of those connections with humanity and with, with other people and, and start to alleviate some of that social isolation as well. Like there's so many components of it, but I think learning from other people who have done it is probably the best way to know that it's possible. Um, for me, um, my first introduction, it wasn't living well with pain. It goes back to, again, this validation. Uh, and oddly enough, it was through an interventional pain clinic that I was referred to to have a biomedical procedure. I have a spinal cord stimulator. And through that process in 2004, they talked, they gave me a little bit of information on um, what we refer to as self-management techniques. Had never been introduced to me before, but it wasn't explained. It was very, um, it was really adjunct. It was just sort of, here's some information on things like relaxation and breathing. Um, so for me, I had, I, I ignored it. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I ignored it, and on the last day, I decided I should probably listen to this shit because um, I had nothing else to do. Um, and it, it just kind of resonated with me a little bit. Um, so, and that then led me into a lot of what Joe's talked about, sort of seeking out more knowledge, um, interacting with others that um, you know, live with pain, and started to understand the concept of being able to live better despite the pain. Because again, up to that, I was all, I just need to find the right solution to make it go away. Now my entire focus is, I have this pain, but there are things that I can do to live well with it, or live better with it. What would you tell, from a what would you tell or ask a clinician uh, about having that conversation with someone? Have the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Open might the be a friggin' theme. door. <laughs> like, have it. And, 
And uh, again, my experiences were really disconnected, and, and I'm sure that we're starting to see things come together a little more cohesively. But have the conversation. Don't be afraid to say to them, there are things that you can do to improve your quality of life despite your pain. Yeah. It's, and, and it can be a bit of a hard conversation. And I get that people have to be at a place, um, I sort of this intersection that I refer to it, where they're ready to have that conversation. So if they're not quite there, you need a little bit of pushback, it's okay, just maybe revisit that later. But you gotta have the conversation. <laughs> Hey, great. All right, Julie? German. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Keith. I'm, I'm kind of struggling to formulate this question in my own head, so forgive me. It's a bit of a ramble, but it's really... Um, Joe, you talked about the dark days and not being ready at that point, perhaps, to articulate um, what was going on. And, Keith, you talked about validation being that almost that penny drop moment to help you to move forward. And... And, and I'm guilty at times in my career of having people come in, trying to maybe have these conversations, and then going to a place of, oh, do you know what, it's not the right time for that person. And it's almost like my get out of jail free card, you know, it's, a, it's not the right time for them. Hey, I tried, mm -hmm. and letting them go. And I'm just wondering from both of you, if you have any tips, because <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose the question is, is there a point when it isn't the right time for somebody, or they're just not able or ready, or for whatever reason, to go on that journey right now, and they still have to go through a bit of an exploring, the, there must be something to fix this. And is it a cop-out for the clinician like me to say, do you know what, it's not the right time. I'll plant a seed and I'll let it go. It's probably uh, both. Mm -hmm. You know, because <laughs> these conversations are hard, it, and it's hard for both people, and it all depends on, on, you know, your context for that day, too, and how much you have to be able to give to having a difficult conversation with someone. Um, but I, I don't know, like, because people ask all the time, like, what could have been said early on that would have changed things, and I can only live the life that I've lived, so I, I don't know what that conversation would have looked like, but I do think that 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 validation piece at, at, is so important and it, it sets up the stage for if that conversation is possible. And, and we often, I'm not saying you, but that piece almost get, gets, or gets, gets, gets skipped over a lot. So in all of their interactions before coming to you, that's been their experience. You know? so, they, so their expectations coming in are, are shaped by all of those previous experiences, so they might not be ready to have that conversation. And I don't think it's a cop out to say we've we tried to have this conversation and it didn't work. But in, in like following John Lawner's kind of thought process and just following wherever they take the conversation, then because I think we have a goal for that person, you know, because we, we want to help people, so we want to steer it in a direction to get them the information that we think that they need. Um, and perhaps just letting where they want to go just be where it is for that day. And I don't think that that's, that that's a cop-out. Um, this stuff is hard. I mean, it's, it's hard. And some people aren't going to have the capacity to be open to it. I was listening to NPR the other day, and it was talking about education. And it said, said students can't learn until they feel safe, heard, and seen. And I think that's so true for patients, too. And you might do the best that you can to help them feel safe, but, but that's not the only thing that contributes to their sense of safety and, and their sense of you know, th perceived threat in the world. Um, but you can be that person that starts to, to show that there is safety out there, if that makes any sense. I feel like I just had a really rambling answer to your no, no, rambling question. <laughs> And, and just to pick up on that a little bit, it, and you will hear me say the same thing over, and it's about that validation. And I mean, my validation moment was a pretty spectacular moment for me. And I don't, and this I don't say that lightly. This is one of my favorite lightly. stories. So I will tell that story, and then I'll just. Um, right. So 2004, when um, I've been having, um, in the city that I lived in, in British Columbia, I was having uh, paravertebral nerve block injections, which um, aren't the most comfortable. And the last round of them, he went a little too deep with the needle, and he actually gave me a partial pneumo. And he said, we should probably stop these. Um, and he referred me to this clinic, and he's like, all very offhanded, right? Because that's the way healthcare was. Nothing cohesive. It was, you know, maybe give this a try. So I go to the clinic. Um, this is 2004. I've been playing this game since 86. A lot of just, what do you want us to do? And I'm, I'm sitting there. And the doctor, David Hunt, Dr. David Hunt, is doing the intake for me. And uh, he's asking questions, and I'm just sitting, and I'm going through everything by rote. 
You know, I'm not even looking at them because I, I tell you the truth, I probably really didn't, I don't know how engaged I was. Um, and then he stopped talking. And I looked over at him and he puts his pen down and I'm like, holy shit, they figured it out, I'm nuts. <laughs> this is it, <laughs> it finally happened and they throw me. And he looked at me and he said, it's okay, we believe you. Those three words, Joe has heard me say this a lot. I have two pretty spectacular defining moments in my life. The day I got married and the day David Hunt said, we believe you. And a lot of my anger and stress just started to fall down right there because he validated everything I had been living for the last 18 years. The validation, it might not be the answer. It might not be like, hey, now we can have this conversation. Everything's great. Planting the seed, don't underestimate don't the importance underestimate of that. that. And maybe you yeah. need to back away a little bit because somebody, I had a, prior to that, I had a lot of anger. I was a real prick. I know, believe it or not, this lovable guy. And he's from um, Canada. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was pretty angry, and I was pretty angry at the healthcare system. Um, so I probably wasn't ready to jump in right away. But validation opens the door. I, I can't tell you how important that is. So if you can validate that experience, it gives you the opportunity to start to have those conversations. You might need to back away because today's not a good day, but I do not believe you will go wrong. And, and it being explicit, you know, it could be awkward to say to someone, we believe you, but it could also be, you know, a profound moment for that person because they might have been disbelieved for so long. And it's, that validation is, is massive. That, that validation as a person, that you are a person of worth and value. So I'm going to sit down and have a conversation with you. And, and just through that conversation, I'm showing you that you're a person of worth and value. And then also validation of that your experience is very real. You know, it's very real. There's very real things going on in, in your biology, and, and it's not all in your head. And making those things explicit can be really powerful for that person. I mean, it's not going to be like, like the sun yeah. shining <laughs> down yeah. and like glitter explodes in yeah. the background. But, yeah, I but don't remember that. It can, no. It can be, yeah, maybe, well, maybe it will maybe. be that. Yeah. Options. Are canon. We have options. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it, it can be life-changing for that person, even if it's not within that moment. Yeah. Um, it can set up the, the stage for that to be a life-changing thing. It turned me into the happy, joyful, wonderful person you see before you now. <laughs> Thank you. OK, now another question from online, Anne McCullough. Were either of you introduced to a health psychologist? No. Um, the interesting, well, being in the workers' compensation system and working for a fire department, when my surgeon recommended that like more psychosocial approaches be taken, the department wanted, or the you know system wanted me to do a psych eval, which would have jeopardized potentially my career. So. I didn't do it. It's, di it's much different. Like, go talk to a health psychologist, and we're going to do a psych eval. Like, those are two different <laughs> yeah. kinds of yeah. conversations. Yeah. So, no, I didn't yeah. talk to a psychologist. It was never offered to me. Um, a traumatic experience in, at 16 years old, um, and, and nobody ever said you probably should talk to somebody about what this will be like. Hey, Julie, do we have someone in the room? Yeah, um, I want to follow up and get you guys' take on this. So I've been in this game for game, system, workers comp on the provider side in California like you for 25 years. So I'm wrapping my head around something new here that I'm hearing you guys talk about and thinking about is we're, we're hearing these patients' stories, experiences. You, you mentioned it, Joe, um, Joetta, Joe, cup of Joe. I don't know he's a cup of Joe. Joe's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, th this, you mentioned this group called a care support group. So peer, peer group. Peer. For, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Th this to me sounds like actually a, a, another team because, right, we're going we're gonna to help everybody by a team approach. I can't help everybody. That almost needs to be a primary stop. So it's not go to the health, and I'm just throwing this out there and I want your guys' opinion. It's not, I mean, obviously, Keith, you needed to see a medical professional. Joe, you needed to see a medical professional. But other than that, it's not really where the healthcare system, it's in its current model, 
should be the first stop. Well, and, well yeah, what's your thoughts on that? And actually, it's the peer group that should be the first stop. Yeah, well, and, and sure. there are, um, and, and I, I can't give you the, the references for it right now, but I can find it. But there are, there are programs that are in place, too, where there are, I don't know what they're called, but like patient support people. So they're peers that actually go to the appointments with the person in pain. That is a peer that can help them. Because when you're in a lot of pain, it's hard to take on any kind of information, um, any kind of condition, not just, not just pain. I remember when my mom was diagnosed with cancer, um, I went out to, to sit in on those, some of her you know, interactions with her doctor. When we would leave, she wouldn't remember anything. She wouldn't remember, I, and that's, which is why I flew to Michigan, because when I asked her how her appointment went and what the doctor said, she had nothing. So those peers, if they don't have a supportive person that can come with them, can facilitate that too, and that is being done in places. But I think that, like, talk with Sharna too about the stuff that she's doing in Oregon, like that the MAPS program that they've created there has now led to the people who've gone through that program to be peers to come back to facilitate that group. And then that group, has now created their own groups totally separate from the healthcare system where they're continuing to support each other. And then, you know, when they have a flare up, they call each other. They're not calling the healthcare system. So I think it's a really underutilized thing that we we can all in this room start to think about and, and facilitate within our own communities. Because I think it's a really powerful way to in, improve care and improve people's lives because you're providing social connection and, and all of those things as well. Something you said really just hit it. It's connecting that, it's a guide. I call it a guide, which you reference, which actually almost from the beginning, you're given a guide, right? Like Oh, gonna, like the person is right, a guide, not like a map. Right. Yeah. Who, uh, who goes to the appointments with you. That's pretty, yeah, that's a great thought. Because it, I, I, don't, I don't believe the current system is going to serve. So that it what? I don't think the current system is going to serve people. Oh, yeah, know, in I, the states. I agree with I'll that. speak to the states. Uh, just add to what Joe said, I, I would support that. We're starting to see it, um, at least my experience in Canada and British Columbia, they're starting to get to be more programs. Again, nothing's cohesive, a little disjointed, but they're, they're peer support um, groups where people can come together and, and, first of all, remove that isolation and that stigma, but um, talk to people who, who can help, they can all help each other. Um, we have, in the city that I live in, there's an interventional pain clinic and they do uh, pain education, and one of the first things they do is bring the group together as, as a group, and they talk to them about their pain experience, and they go through that validation and everything. And, and I think, I, I'm not, you, you can't, like you said, Jerry, you can't, um, you can't um, sort of ignore the medical system or the, bi, you know, the biomedical part, but there is this need for people to support one another. And just as Joe said, I think what that does is it helps reduce the burden on the healthcare system because in the absence of a support system, I mean, my past experiences were when I would have a flare-up, I didn't know what to do, I went to the ER. Worst friggin' place to go. <laughs> um, so, but if you have an ability to connect with others and, and deal with that, um, you can you can learn you can live better that way and not impact the healthcare system. Do, I mean, I have my my people that when I am having a flare up that I can reach out to and they can you know just provide those gentle reminders mm -hmm. like breathe, breathe, <laughs> like <laughs> like very simple things but that's that's a different message coming from a peer if Keith says that to me it's a different message than it is coming from a healthcare provider where I'm like don't tell me to yeah. breathe yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right so we'll, we'll oh. I was gonna say are we done on on time are we still doing questions Okay. If okay. it's okay. Yeah, we have about No, it's totally okay. I can talk left. all day. Nine, don't know yeah, if we can do this noticed. all day. So. <laughs> you have to talk to Rajram about that. But um, <laughs> sorry. So <laughs> we're going to um, kind of combine Jonathan Hartman's and Jennifer Carr's questions because they're they're both asking, like throughout all of your experience, like what's the best interaction you've had with a practitioner? Um, and and was there someone who in particular who gave you hope and, and how did they do that? For me, it was actually my surgeon. Um, he would, when he would come into the meeting, he would just sit down. There, he had no, there was no computer in front of him. He never had my file in his lap. He never had anything to even write with. And we would have a conversation. Um, and he included me in all of the decision-making process, which, which it would have been nice to have someone in those meetings with me because I just was like, I just want surgery. I don't care what your <laughs> rationale is for it. Just give it to me because that's going to be what, what fixes me. When, 
one um, encounter I just remember in particular, he was training a fellow from the UK to do the, so I had hip surgery for FAI. It's really well supported by the research. Um, <laughs> And so <laughs> he was teaching other surgeons how to do it. So there was, there was a fellow there. Um, and they're having a conversation. And, and there's a whole lot of uncertainty in that conversation that they're having with one another that he doesn't know if surgery is going to fix this problem and all that. And I just remember the, the fellow that he's training kept looking at me like, she's in the room. <laughs> like, should we be having this conversation with her here? And it, my surgeon's response was, it's her hip. Like, he wanted me to be in in those conversations. So he was absolutely wonderful. And, and like I said before, he never once made me feel like my pain wasn't real. He didn't make me feel like it was my fault that the surgery didn't work. He was incredibly, and, and was also very honest in, your pain is real, but there is nothing that I can do about it. Not that there's nothing that can be done, but that he is a surgeon and he, he repairs things surgically and that, that wasn't a, another surgery wasn't an appropriate thing. Um, and he was the one that encouraged me to kind of forge my own path and get out of the workers' compensation system. For me, it was David Hunt. <laughs> and, and in the interface into that, and again, I'm still in, yeah, I'm in a, uh, still within healthcare, I'm a patient. Um, but that team that I have now is um, much more interactive with me. It's a collaborative approach. Um, anything that we do, um, it's done, it's discussed. Um, we talk about it scientifically. I think they've understand now that I'm a bit of a nerd so that when we talk about things, I've probably researched the shit out of it before we're doing it. But it's, it's treating me as a human, as an equal, as, a, as an equal in my healthcare. Um, but it, it needed to have David Hunt validate my experience. I think that's such an important sentence there too, being an equal in your healthcare. You know, that this is, this is a collaboration between two people and not this, we, our systems are set up as a hierarchy where we're being talked to and told to and um, being, you know, spoken with, talked with, yeah. I think is, is really important. My experiences now are more a conversation with Jill. Jill is my doctor and that's how we interact and that's how we communicate now. Um, but it, it's very much an equal playing field. Awesome. Okay, real quick. Um, I don't know if I get to make executive decisions. Um, so there is a 10-minute break scheduled at 11.15. Yes, 11.15. Um, if you guys are happy to keep talking and if people want them to keep talking, just so you know at 11.15 or whenever you need to, you can go have a break. But it, would you guys like to oh, keep? Yeah. All day. I mean, I'll keep talking. I, we could do this all friggin' yeah. day. Okay, so, so just know that if you, if you need a potty break, don't feel bad about getting that. You guys are sick up. of us. It's okay. You can get up be, and leave. I hate to keep asking questions, but you guys are fantastic. So Thank you. So let me just keep asking you questions. Um, you didn't feel validated. Is that what I kind of understand from your, your answers? Yeah. 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 So, so the system... Do, do either of you have an idea of what the system paid for your care to date? You on the left, Joe? Um, I do, it's, it's been a while, but I do have like um, all my paperwork that, that shows it, but I don't remember, so I don't remember what it take is. Take a wild guess. I mean, you had your hip replaced. A, um, I just had it reconstructed. Um, one, I mean, I, I went to physical therapy, to six different physical therapists over that time. I went to two chiropractors, so, but I, I don't know. So, but I, I could get you that answer if you really want reasonable huh? to guess over a hundred thousand dollars if you put in your I don't your think it was that much. TTD, right? You were on TTD as well? I don't know what that is. Uh, total temporary disability. So they were paying you to be off. Yeah, okay. they, were, they were paying me so very I, little I, to be off, yes. I'm familiar with the system. I can tell you it's over 100 grand. Okay. So, and you had a nerve stimulator done? Um, yeah, so up until the point, that validation moment, um, I mean, it, it, I'm from Canada, so I don't know how much it cost, but it was a lot. But so I had, American money? Um, it, it'd be oh, well over, uh, up to 2004, it'd be well over $100,000. Well Cause, over. Because I so, had multiple surgeries and probably 30 so, hospital admissions for pain control. So my question circles back to how do we communicate to the patient, okay? And this is a really, really, really interesting, si sincere question. As a caregiver, 
what is more validating than the system spending that much money on your problem to try to fix your problem? I mean, what more do you want us to do? To Tell us that you believe us and that our pain experience. is real. I'm sorry? Tell us that you believe us and that our pain is real. We wouldn't spend a dime if That's we thought that it wasn't real. Mm. I mean, that, I think that that really is a, is, a, is a hurdle that I'm having a hard time getting over. How much would you spend on something that you didn't think was anything? So, okay, so I think that's the question, is how much would you spend on if you didn't get anything? Is that the, I'm no, looking for your question, yeah, you sir. Know, and, and look, I've thought about this years, not moments or days, but years and years and years as a, like a quaternary pain provider, would, would you both feel better if the system, at the time that you reported whatever your injury was, we could go to the system, figure out exactly how much the average person had money been spent on whatever the injury is, we have that data, and just handed you a check on day one and said, go find, do whatever you want to do, it's up to you. Would, would you feel more validated? I, I mean, no. seriously. My work as a human being has no. nothing to do with the cost of Don't cut of my me a care. check. I'm sorry, what? Don't yeah. cut me a check. Okay, okay. Don't cut me a check. Yeah. Treat me as, do not cut me a check. Treat me as a human being because my injury, uh, injury X, we do this, this, and this, so it's worth $75,000. Don't, don't do that. Our, our worth has nothing to do with the cost of our care. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the pain and suffering. We have a lot of other questions. I know, I realize that. Care. No, no, I re care. Yeah. It's an equalizer for access to care. That's what I'm asking. We have another question up here. I don't want to perpetuate anything. It's simply a comment, and it's, it's a comment as a parent. What spoke to me there was that do we want to show our children that we love them via buying them things? by giving them, yeah. or do we want to spend time with them and have conversations and create memories and, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that can validate a little bit more what, uh, what you guys were trying to express, but that's what I heard from that conversation, and so. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Okay, so we have a question from online. Um, so Laura asks, what do you hope for yourselves now? What do I hope? What do you hope for yourselves now? Like, that's very that's a, broad. That's big, question. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to be taller. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I would like, you know, more equitable care for, for yeah. people. World yeah. peace. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's a lot of yeah. things I hope for. I, I mean, personally, I'm pretty satisfied with my life now. Um, I think I live the best life that I can despite my pain. Uh, my hope for me Living now, his best patient life. Hashtag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, my hope now is term. to continue to have these conversations and to be able to see the change that is occurring um, continue to change, maybe even speed it up a little bit, but I'm not so greedy, I will take change um, at any level. But to have these conversations um, to understand that there is a much more than just a physical um, relationship to people's pain. Yeah. World peace. My, yeah, my hope too is, I mean, is <laughs> Some, just continue these conversations because I think really good things are born of, of the conversations that take place at conferences like this from people who have different perspectives and are, are you know, coming to have new narratives about, about what we're facing as humans. And my hope is that we can just be humans to other humans more. I think that's kind of what it boils down to. I really love that answer. Just be human to other humans. Just be a human to another human. Julie has someone over on the side. So I've heard a lot of how the medical community has not responded and doing that. And then looking at a biopsychosocial model, there's also, and you hit it to it uh, initially, not being a part of your fighter family anymore, and you not having an identity and looking at that. Out of my own pain experience or my own trauma, traumatic uh, car crash injury uh, experience and growing through that, I also find that we need to acknowledge for, our, for the individual in front of us that their social circles don't know how to help them 
or mm -hmm. how to point them towards something else. So the medical community may say, go find this, but the people, the people around them don't know how to point them in those ways too. And I'm wondering, does that make this, that comment make sense? And could you speak to a little bit more of the importance you see of that as for us as clinicians to be aware of for the people we interact with? And, and I hope I, I'm understanding it, it right, but I think, and Melanie spoke about this yesterday too, starting to address those social conversations and, and our societal understanding of pain and these things. And it was really interesting to me to, just to, to kind of realize how we talk about, and, and like recognize it, that we talk about like pain, grief and loss and those things so much differently than we talk about pain and why is that? And so when people leave the clinic and they're going home, they're not supported in their communities and their families because they don't have an understanding of, of what pain is. So how do we start addressing that? And I, I don't know the answers to those questions and I think that's why we need to have these conversations. How do we start changing those societal never, narratives? How do we help facilitate a family's understanding or you know, the, the people that they're surrounded with <laughs> Um, their understanding of pain and how best to support that person and, and to empower and enable them to live a better life. Um, both, I think that until we do that, we're gonna have real hard time just trying to fix individuals. You know, and if we're not working on the context and, and culture and places where people live too, you can't just fix that individual when they're, they're going into a, an environment that's not supportive of whatever change needs to take place. I don't know if that addressed your question at all, but I would love to talk about it more too yeah. around. And I think that's a very important, yep. important thing to to talk about and, and discuss, and would love to explore it more too. I just don't have any answers for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and I'm so glad that you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna go actually to Lysanthia's question. How can we help the people in pain that we work with to advocate for themselves and for their learning about pain and living well? Often they encounter other healthcare professionals that might disbelieve them when they ask for help. So in a perfect world, we would have a healthcare system that's all on the same page and can do things like validate people and provide them hope and all that. Um, so. In a disjointed system, I would say you be the calm port in the storm and connect with them and validate them and understand that they've had these interfaces with others that have been less than um, positive, but be the one to take the time and connect with them and have a conversation, reassure them, plant those seeds. And I would offer, and this is a bit of a blanket statement because humans were all different, over time that message will start to be imprinted and, but it, it will require a little bit of work, especially when they're getting other noise from the outside where it's saying it's not real. And because um, again, in my case, I had lots of, there's nothing wrong with you. And all it took was David Hunt. Yep. <clears throat> so <laughs> Keith specifically, you've talked about your David Hunt moment. Yes. And how beneficial that was. And I'm curious to how, how many David Hunt moments did you think you, do you think you had before the David Hunt moments? Like how many like, healthcare professionals spoke with a similar language presentation, but you were not in the correct space to receive it properly. And so can you speak to the readiness that it took for you and the journey that you had to go through in order to be ready to receive the David Hunt moment? Good question. 
it wasn't me. No. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very important question because we have to be self-reflective and self-aware um, because you do need to be, um, you need to be ready to hear that message, maybe not fully embrace it. Um, I would suggest in, in my experience, because I was dealing with a system that was mostly, if I can't fix you, there's nothing I can do for you. I may have missed some subtle cues. It's entirely possible because, like Joe said, I was just looking for the right surgery to get it fixed. Um, and so maybe as I got a little older and, and a little wiser, maybe I was a little more open to that. But I do not recall, I can honestly say I don't recall there being an opportunity with another healthcare provider where I even heard a little bit of that until I heard, doc, you know, until I heard David say, like, we believe you. Because up until then, it was mostly, we've done everything we can, there's nothing wrong with you. I, I could have missed some cues, though, because I, um, I, was, I was pretty bullheaded. I was just trying to push through a lot of shit. So. Okay, so from Steve Novashen, who's here somewhere. Have any of your former healthcare providers listened to your stories live in person, and have you ever thought about what it would mean or not? Maybe to them or to you, actually, for them to hear it. I, um, I think one of my PTs might have seen one of my recorded, uh, like a recorded session that I did. It might actually have been the patient panel from the first year. Um, and she's, she's the only one I know of in, specifically. We're still friends. Like my care providers were all wonderful. So it's not speaking t about individuals. It's about systems and, and the people that I've interacted with and have spoken with since that are part of my care, um, like her, recognize those those problems too. For her, I was that patient that that had her questioning her own beliefs about what pain was and what to do about it because she couldn't she could not come up with any more exercises for me to do. Like I was doing all the, I was doing step ups to treatment tables and like single leg squats on BOSU balls with weights and like we're just trying to do all kinds of crazy things. And she's like, okay, maybe this isn't the thing. Um, so that's the only one that I know of for sure though. Um, I'm, I'm not aware. Um, I know my primary care um, team is aware of the work that I do. I don't know if they've seen everything. And um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I would hope that if they saw it, that it would um, help validate some of the work that they're doing. Um, but I don't know if they they really know. <laughs> okay, so that is all the time we have for for the patient panel. So thank you guys so much. Thank you all thank for you. listening. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't get this over. There's a reason why that's always the fave. Um, all right, thanks, you guys. We do have, um, so Rajam has arranged for one of the um, vendors to come in and speak a bit about, about their product. So the stage is yours. No, no, the, they talked through the break, and everyone should have known that. No, no, we agreed on that, I thought. <laughs>